specific questions based on what you've said. Okay, so can you test to see if the mic is working? Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, okay, so let me bring it closer. Yeah. So thank you very much. I would rather subtract something from your introduction. Um, I retired as vice chancellor. Uh, you didn't add that. Otherwise, uh, I may be usurping the powers of the current vice chancellor. Yeah. So I retired as vice chancellor in July 2022. Right. Uh, uh, but I still belong to the university. Uh, I think, I think it's very uh, important that we, we get this whole issue in perspective. Um, and I wanted to speak to a few slides for just five minutes, uh, which has been projected over there. Uh, as far as data research management is concerned. The next slide, please. Yeah. So we are, we are looking at basically the whole process of uh, producing data, storing it, and being able to retrieve it at appropriate time uh, by the relevant people. I'm sure the introductory comments would have covered uh, some of these issues already. And uh, uh, it, it involves usually the development of some, some methods and processes which we all have to ensure that we stick to if we want to get this whole uh, business in perspective. So it's a cycle, and uh, uh, I, I said next slide. So I usually like to operate my own thing, but. Oh, I can see my slides here. Yeah, I can see my slides here. <laughs> you can see it, <laughs> because he's not, uh -huh. this is what I spoke to. So I think, I think if you go to the next slide, it will just summarize the whole thing. It, it's, a, it's a cycle. It's a, it's a whole process that we, we usually go through. So we need to plan the data uh, collection processes. We need to collect the data. We will need to analyze the data and then store it in a form that can be retrieved uh, in an appropriate way. And then comes the issue of making the data available sharing the data. Uh, that is where sometimes we've had some, some challenges as to who can access the data and uh, who has the right to uh, access the data. And even to reuse the data, there are hawks around who usually don't do much. They are the, the smart computer gurus. They want to wait for you to do all the donkey work in the field and then they want to jump onto the data because of the whole issue of data access and open access to data and all that. And you see that many of the publications that are coming out all over the place uh, uh, are being led by people who are sitting in the, the developed north because they have the, the, the smart computing processes and uh, methods to be able to, to process this kind of data. So there is a challenge there. Uh, the next slide, please. So we, we, we need to ensure that the data that is stored can be retrieved uh, in a proper way. And also the whole regulatory environment uh, in terms of uh, uh, meeting the ethical standards of the data collection uh, and the ethical standards of the data use are also very, very relevant. So we want to be sure that, next slide, I don't like next slide, next slide, but it's, uh, so there are, there are three key points that I want to, to, to re-emphasize and then I, I stop there. The data must be well documented. And when it is stored, it must be secure. And then also, it must be easily accessible by the relevant individuals. So the other side, let me give you an anecdote. 
when I started as a young scientist, one of the first papers I published was in the journal that is run by the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. And my paper was on the economic bedding of lymphatic filariasis. So one time I wanted to, those were the days where when you publish you get reprints. So they posted reprints to me. I think there were about 30 or so reprints. And I gathered them preciously and I shared to people that I thought. And so under a three-year program known as the K Innovation Partnership Program between uh, uh, MESTI and the Science and Technology Policy Institute of Korea. We have actually developed a master plan that is going to uh, support us over the next 10 years to transform our research and innovation ecosystem. It's something that we have dubbed the decade of innovation. Now, um, this master plan aside, the Koreans have also managed to secure funding for us to, from 2024 to 2026, develop a nationwide, uh, what we call science and technology uh, information system uh, in the country. This system is supposed to connect all the actors, including the researchers, the research institutions, and then those who are going to be the end users of this research. And of course, those who are sitting in the middle, what we call the knowledge sharing facilitators, uh, the support programs like the uh, Data uh, uh, Integrity Commission, the intellectual property rights management, the financial institutions uh, that are sitting there to provide you the finance for you to be able to do the work that you are doing very well. So over the next three years, from 2024 to 2026, uh, we are developing this infrastructure and they are going to also uh, seek funding that we will have to add to to be able to build this infrastructure to connect all of you so that some of the challenges that uh, uh, Prof. Japon talked about, uh, we'll be able to help you uh, to meet them and for us to be able to generate quality data. That will be the basis of all the things that we are doing if we are serious about uh, making science, technology, and innovation the driver of our national uh, uh, development. So uh, this is what I can share with you uh, uh, briefly for now. And if you have uh, any need for uh, some detail about this work, I'll be very, very happy to share that with you as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Boachi. Um, you have raised um, and highlighted for us the importance that uh, exists for data that are collected and uh, manipulated, managed, etc., by national agencies responsible for research, how important it is to keep, for Ghanaians to keep control of that, uh, for data sovereignty, to make sure that the data that are captured locally are meant and used for local development opportunities. So thank you very much for that, and we'll come back to that later. And finally, our last panelist, um, uh, Mr. Chikabatia. <laughs> he is very patient with my, my pronunciations. Um, we're going to hear from you, CEO of Garnet. Of course, uh, Garnet oversees infrastructure, research infrastructures in and universities nationally. So perhaps from your perspective, you can tell us a bit about what you see as issues and challenges there. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Um, let me start this way. If you look at internet traffic, I mean, we see, we monitor and see internet traffic. As far as we are concerned, you see that the downloads are more than the uploads, which is a reflection of our economy. We import more than we export. And that translates also into data and information. Why is it that we are consuming most of the time and not exporting. 
Is it because we don't have anything to share with the rest of the world? Think about that carefully. And when you link it with what uh, Professor Japon highlighted, where he did work, which was then published elsewhere, and he had to go and pay for his own work to download. So there, there straight away you see the difficulty that we have is that we do not have repositories in country where we can store our own data and allow for others to come and pay and download from their end and upload from, from this side. Okay? The, the challenge we see is an infrastructure deficit. And that's where Garnet comes in. Garnet, the main purpose of Garnet is to create the enabling infrastructure to allow not only for uh, research and education data to be collected, curated, and stored, and also published, but to provide access to it. It's, it's the same as not having the data there at all. And these days, we know uh, we all work on the fly. So we also try to provide what we call mobility. So you do not have to sit in a specific place to have access to the data. It should be possible for you to continue to have access to that data, even when you are out of the office. Anywhere you are, you should be able to, to, to access that data. And therefore, Garnet's main purpose is to provide connectivity, backend infrastructure, for the collection and storage of uh, uh, research data and also to provide access and security to whatever data is, is, is stored. Uh, we believe that in doing this, we will encourage, first of all, researchers to be able to collaborate among themselves in country and globally and also have secure data stored in country to allow for others to come in and we can monetize that data as uh, uh, Oliver said, is the new gold. Information, and data is, 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 the, is, is, is the gold and is the, uh, uh, what drives and what gives power to people these days. If you have control over data, then you have control over information and you know a lot more about people that you are dealing with. If you go out to negotiate with anyone and the person has more information about you than you about them, they have power over you. So we need to try and reverse that, and that is the role that Garnet tries to play by providing the needed infrastructure for education and research uh, 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 operators to go about their work more efficiently. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Lucas, is it okay if I say Lucas? Because I'm having struggling with the. Okay, so um, thank you, all three panelists. Now I'll come back to you each with one question before I open the floor to the audience to ask you questions. Uh, Professor Jiapong, you mentioned this issue of basically um, people having access to data generated from the global south and basically being able to publish or to um, sort of use that data for their own advancement without the country itself being able to um, lay claim to that data or you need to perhaps um, expand a bit on this and w what would you see as relevant policies or principles or practices that need to be um, instantiated at national or institutional levels that might help to address this particular problem? Yeah, thank you for raising a very important issue. I, I, I think that um, it is, is it a, it's a tough ask, but it's not impossible. We have to start from somewhere. The, the whole research architecture, the whole data sharing is skewed in a particular direction. These days, when you get a grant, a research grant, you have to sign on to 
an agreement which says that you make your data publicly available and all that. So, and uh, I don't know how many research scientists are amongst this group, but from my personal experience, over 98% of the research money I have received came from outside the country. Less than 2% came from within. So when we sign onto these contracts, they tell you it is public funded research. So if it is the US government that is funding you, uh, they say you must make your data available. If it is the UK government that is funding you, they say you must make your, your data available. So the whole cycle for me would begin when we begin to fund our own research and we are in control. Then what Lucas brought up about having a repository uh, in country uh, would begin to kick in. And then what Mr. Boati also raised about having uh, policies and systems uh, that govern uh, data collected in the country could also work. Because if I have written an application to uh, the Gates Foundation, basically patenting their words and, and things like that. It was a very tall order. The processes that we, we went through, I don't know whether uh, any of you are here. Uh, uh, at that time, Diana was taking the lead at the University of Ghana. I don't know whether any of the team are here. There was a point in time where we did some work uh, with Noguchi on uh, I think it was leishmaniasis, and we wanted to patent it. The cost of having an IP lawyer going through all the processes and all that, uh, we just, university. back and uh, I appear to be complaining and complaining but it's 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 quite a big challenge how do we solve it how do we solve this um, <laughs> can, we can leave it there and move on to mr. Boachi who I, I will also <laughs> challenge to address this very same problem, a differential of 98% of your funding coming from abroad. I'm talking of personal. Personally, yeah, yeah. as opposed to 2%. Yeah. There's not much you can do. It appears yeah. in terms of um, getting some equity yeah. into that arrangement. Yeah. But Mr. Boachi, you have been um, collaborating at a national level with Korea on other matters to do with policy. Is there a chance? that there can, some sort of equity could be introduced into these sorts of collaborative efforts? Yeah, uh, the points that Professor Japon has raised are very, very, very important. Uh, since we came into office in 2017, these are some of the things that we have identified to be the root causes of why after 60 years, uh, Ghana is 
10,000 miles uh, behind South Korea, who we started at almost the same level with at the time of our independence. They had just come out of uh, their war. They were very, very poor. In fact, Ghana was ahead of them in some aspects. But today, they are so far ahead, the 10th largest economy in the world. And when you look at the Global Innovation Index, Korea is actually the fifth in the whole world. The fact is, they made a conscious decision to use their intellect as um, the vehicle for their development. And they have consistently worked on it up to now. And so what we decided to do was to change the paradigm in this country. First, the research that Professor Japan is talking about, most of it is conducted without any regard to the needs of this country. I, I would dispute that. Well, I would like If to you are talking about the funding, that is the issue. Well, but the relevance mm -hmm. is a different well, thing. The thing, the thing is this, yeah. that if the one who is providing you the funds yeah. is going to tell you, uh, you know, uh, what their interests are, definitely will be driven by some of their interest, all right? And in most cases, it also turns out that at the end of the research work, they own the intellectual property rights. Even if Ghana owns part of it, uh, it's, it's very minimal. And because we don't have what it takes to transform this IP into actual products and services, we don't derive too much benefit from it. And so they need to ensure that the research that our researchers are conducting, these are people that we have trained, people that we have provided infrastructure in terms of buildings and equipment, people that we have employed, we pay their salaries, their benefits and everything. And then somebody from the US brings you some money and says, do this work, and then you do it. At the end, uh, even if it has any relevance to what we are doing in this country, what are we doing with the IP rights that come out of it? And so uh, trying to commercialize it and then turning it into products and services that benefit this country is also a, a very, very important uh, component of that. And so this 10-year program or 10-year master plan that I mentioned, these are the issues that we are going to address. Uh, and we have started the process of drafting legislation to uh, really institutionalize this, what we call the Ghana Innovation and Research Commercialization Center, or GEC Center, whose primary purpose is to sit in the middle of this research and innovation ecosystem, do the research planning with those who are conducting the research. We should not allow research to be done in this country that has no relevance to what we are doing as a, as a nation. That, you know, it's somebody else who is going to bring you the money all the time, like 98% of the time, they are bringing you the money. So they are definitely going to dictate, uh, you know, what goes into the research. That's number one. Number two, this funding issue. In 2020, we have managed to pass a law. Uh, it's called the National Research Fund Act at 1056, which says that now this country has to allocate not less than 1% of our GDP towards research and innovation. If we are able to operationalize this law, definitely we won't have a need to always be asking or begging others to provide us the funding that is necessary for us to do our work. Now, the, the only reason why that has not been operationalized, you know the economic situation that we've been in uh, since COVID. And so if this law is operationalized, uh, we are saying that about 400 to $500 million every year must be allocated to uh, research and innovation.
Um, I, I, I just want to emphasize that, yes, Dr. Uh, Professor Japon's um, issues and concerns are very, very important. This government recognizes all of that, but we are doing something about it through these programs. You know, where we are, there is no way we are going to be able to do all the things that we have to do without collaborating with our partners. Korea happens to be one partner that personally, I think it's very genuine. They are very, very committed. You know, at the end of the three years, uh, the first phase of this project, they have actually proposed actual projects in this country that they are bringing their own money, in some cases $10 million, uh, $7 million, and so on, about six of them, and saying that if we are interested in working with them to do it, to come here and uh, actually partner with us, to do them, and place them in this country, not place them in Korea or, or anything. And this second phase uh, that I mentioned, where we are going to try and develop nationwide infrastructure to connect all of you, uh, dealing with some of the challenges that uh, Professor Japon has talked about. I want to call on all of you, I appeal to you, to partner with us and get this thing done. We can't just be talking about these issues when we don't have any plans to try to do something about them. So, so I want to thank you very much for that. M Madam Thank Moderator, you. I think I need to clarify can, an issue. Can you respond, I, I need to, uh, Professor Gepon? Yes. Um, Mr. Boatier is getting defensive and uh, trying to, it's as if he's speaking for government. We are not here to speak for government or against government. I was part, a very active part, participant in the whole process of the National Research Fund, so I know the details of it. It's very unfortunate GTEC is not represented here. GTEC would have given a lot more details. And I'm very happy with it. Since 1998, I have been championing the whole issue of the, the government funding research. So from Abuja to Algiers to Paris, all those declarations, Ghana is always the first to sign. But now we have taken it forward. And we have, it's not just a bill, now there is an act. The president has accented to it, but the money hasn't gone in yet. As we speak now, research is conducted all over the country. Government is paying all the research scientists at CSIR and all those other places. Unfortunately, government is not giving money for research. They pay our salaries. So we need to go and look for money to do the research. And in the process of looking for the money, it is not free money that somebody gives you. You write and compete for a grant and say, I want to do this work on malaria because malaria is killing our people. So it is evaluated in the international community and they give you the money for the work that you say you want to do, not what they want to do. But the condition is that once it is money that has come out from there, when you get the data, the data must be open and shared with everybody. That's the point I'm talking about. So I'm not talking about um, any other issue, and we shouldn't get very defensive about it. It is very, very important. And this 98% thing that I talked about didn't start in 2017 where he, he referenced. I've been doing research since, uh, look at my gray hair, you know. So it is, we, should, we shouldn't uh, relate it to specific government issues. Let's deal with it as a nation. Percent of our GDP, we're, we're very specific that not less than 1% of our GDP should go into this research fund. And then the process of putting out calls for Ghanaians to compete and get the research money to do their own research. That is when his office will be able to put in the rules and the regulations. But not when the money is coming from outside there. Their office has been doing a lot of good work. The University of Ghana issue that I mentioned about, 
the funding came from Mesty. So he wasn't in that place at that time, so he doesn't know. But the money came from Mesty, the same ministry that he is representing. So government is doing its bit, but it is just not enough under the current circumstances. That's the point I'm trying to make. Understood, yes, very big challenges yeah. there. And my final question uh, to Lucas is around uh, some of the um, issues you were communicating about research infrastructures. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, security and privacy aspects when it comes to supporting data repositories or uh, other data structures, research infrastructures. Um, uh, with respect to op open data sharing, etc. Um, we recently did a survey on research data management with the Reforum members, and one of the key issues that came up was around security. A lot of them were saying we can't be assured of security and privacy in sharing our data, therefore we don't want to do that. Is there anything you can offer with respect to that? Okay. so. Um Security has been an issue for a very long time, and uh, um, a lot of people have been hesitant in you know, making their data available because they are not too sure who has access to it. Uh, fortunately, now we have the National Information Security Agency, authority I believe it is, that is um, leading and championing uh, the establishment of appropriate security for critical infrastructure in this country. Um, as a result, a number of institutions that provide critical infrastructure, such as Garnet, have been um, um, encouraged to create security teams, okay? um, security response teams to ensure that we are able to uh, protect any data that is uh, made available for sharing among, I mean, within the community. So um, what I would say is um, institutions such as ours that have been identified to, to do that need to go through a process to get accredited and um, licensed by the Data Protection Unit Agency to perform those, those, those uh, 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 functions. So in terms of security, I would say we are moving in the right direction. But the most important, and I'd like to touch on other things that uh, panel members have said, is the attitude of we ourselves, okay? I think that we need to be able to work at changing the mindset of the community, okay? We don't seem to attach importance to what we say. We say things and we don't follow up. And I'm going to you know, uh, uh, comment on something that has been troubling me a lot. We provide connectivity to universities and research institutions. We did write a proposal to the Ministry of Communications for support to provide connectivity to universities. Would you believe it that for two years we've been fighting to take connectivity to CSIR? CSIR is the heart of research in this country. If you go to CSIR, there's what we call high performance computing infrastructure. That piece of equipment has been sitting there for the past five years. No data center to accommodate it. No power, no cooling, okay? And we advocate that, move it from there and take it to the national data center. It's not happening. So, and it's frustrating. That is money that government has spent to buy the equipment but we cannot operationalize it. So you ask yourself, where is the problem? Okay, so I think one of the things we need to do is to sit back and ask ourselves why there are certain things that we must do 
but we don't do them. Okay? We don't do them. And so there has to be accountability. If, if you have to operationalize an equipment like that, and it's sitting there for one year, two years, three years, and nothing is happening, someone must ask you a question, because that equipment is needed for research. There's a smaller version of it at the University of Ghana uh, that we put in. By the way, I'm not the current uh, chief information technology officer for University of Ghana. I used to be. And Professor Japan was my boss when I was there. We put a smaller version of it there. And if you all remember, during the COVID, the genome sequencing yeah. that Noguchi yeah. managed to do, yeah. they used the high performance computing system called Zaputo at the University of Ghana to do that. Yeah. The one at CSR is like 10 times more powerful than that one. But it's been in a box for the past five years. And I'm saying it this deliberately so that <laughs> uh, Oliver can facilitate for that device to move from the CSR to the National Data Center so that all of us can use it. Yeah? Thank you very much. So, uh, Mr. Boachi, please. <laughs> well. <laughs> this is very, very interesting. And uh, I want to add more to what uh, uh, my colleague has said. I've been part of this whole high com uh, computing uh, system from its beginning. First, <clears throat> this is equipment that was donated to us by South Africa through a project that we were doing with them. Remember the Kuntunsi satellite dish. We turned it into a space exploration system as opposed to the data system that it used to be when Ghana Telecom was using it to, uh, as a medium of transmission of data into the country. So uh, through this project that we were doing with South Africa, uh, they decided that they will support us to transform the original equipment into a space exploration piece of equipment. And the high computing uh, uh, system is a version of what South Africa is using in their country. And so this became uh, redundant, and they agreed to uh, let us uh, have it. Through us, in fact, myself, we renovated space at Ghana um, at CSR, okay, to create a data center and office space for this high-performance computing system to be used. That aspect of it, we did it very, very successfully. Um, as to transforming the system or operationalizing the system. First, we need to understand that it's not me or anybody at the ministry who is going to do that work. It is people who are actually on the ground, the technical people uh, who are supposed to do that. There's a unit at CSR, Inst uh, they are the ones who are supposed to be uh, you know, undertaking the specific activities that are needed for this uh, operationalization to take place. In fact, because of the challenges associated with funding, I remember that when we approached ECG for power to be connected to CSR, the cost of that alone, Mesty was not in any position to do that. Now, if CSR, uh, doing some, uh, in, you know, uh, IGF activities and generating funds. If this is a priority to them, they must be willing to spend some of the money to get this thing done. Data, you know, the, the connectivity, that is another issue besides the power. So that's another issue. In fact, this idea of moving it uh, from uh, CSR to 
uh, neater, you know, for it to be used at that level. They have discussed it with us, and I, I gave them my total support. The reality is that it's not me who should go and move that equipment and put it there. In other words, there are uh, some of us who think that government must do everything, even the things that we don't know how to do. We are supposed to do them. I fully support all the things that you have said, but the effort must come from all of us to make it happen. And if we are not willing to do that, frankly, there's not much else. Me, I try, I, I see things above the horizon, and I try to create it. But there are those who are supposed to put their hands on it and make it happen. And so this gets to shed light, you know, for the benefit of those who are here. If somebody hears that the equipment is sitting there and nobody wants to do anything about it. That is not true. Those of us who brought it are willing or have even agreed that please move it so that you can use it. I've had discussions with um, uh, people at KU KNUST. They also have another version of the high performance computing system. They wanted to move it over there. Frankly, I don't care where it stands or where it sits. As long as you are using it to do work for this country, you know, I support you. And so if you have any ideas or how you can move it to the next step, please come to my office. Let's discuss it and we will do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Madam Moderator, you may be running out of time, but there is something that I want to bring up. Uh, there are many librarians here, I believe. I saw on paper that librarians were supposed to be here. One of the challenges that I had when uh, I was school vice chancellor and when I was vice chancellor was getting money to pay for subscriptions. And this whole issue of open access comes up. So it is a bigger version of me putting in my credit card. Uh, I mean, Elsevier, and I'm not picking on Elsevier for any specific, I, this is the first group that came to mind. I mean, they, they provide the service, but we have to pay so much, you know? So at a point in time, when I moved to UHAS, I mean, our budget is a drop in the ocean. We couldn't afford. So we had to piggyback on, on University of Ghana. And then after a while, they say no. They will not allow us to piggyback on University of Ghana. We tried as a country, when I was chairman of Vice Chancellor's Ghana, to get a subscription for Ghana so that all of us, all the tertiary institutions and all the, the research institutions could have access but they want to deal with the individual institutions so that they can maximize their, their, their profit. So this is a bigger version of asking for my credit card. And I think if we really, really, really want to address this issue of research data management, this is one of the things that we need to tackle. Otherwise, we are not going anywhere. sort of expand a bit more on that, but just one last word from Lucas here before we open the floor. Okay, so it, um, it's good that uh, Prof has talked about this. We have a collaboration with uh, Kali, and I see Nina there at the far end. Right now, the subscriptions, the way the service providers charge you for the subscriptions is on uh, head count. So they look at the university. This university has 60,000 and they base their charge on that. The other side of managing that is to uh, charge based on actual, actual users. The way to get that done is what we are trying to do by creating what we call the federation. So if we create the Garnet Identity Federation or the Wakren Identity or Edu ID and all of that. What that means is that the service providers will um, be within our community and make the services available. And the universities 
or identity providers, so to speak, will then ensure that any time their members try to access, they are authenticated. So it's like having a passport and going to market, like the, the West Africa economic community. If you have a passport that is allowed to consume services within that community, then you are counted. So if we are able to do that, it means that at the end of every period, you only pay for your users who have access. The experience from the University of Ghana is that we have only 30% usage for what we pay for. And the university pays I mean, tens of thousands of dollars a year, and yet we use only 30%, uh, uh, which means the 70 goes to waste. But if we establish that duration, you only pay for those that are in there, because at that point, we are able to demonstrate actual usage. Now we are not able to, so they charge you based on your account. And they'll go, right? you say you have to put out based on that. Thank you very much. I just wanted to make. Thank you. And thank you, panelists, because you have raised some very pertinent issues, which I hope now our audience would be able to speak to. So I'm opening the floor now for questions from the audience for the panelists. Uh, thank you. Can you say who you are and your institution, please? Thank you. Uh, when you go to a restaurant, you have the chefs who sit in the kitchen who prepare the food. And then you have the waiters who actually take the food and they serve it. The waiters who serve the food are the ones who come into contact with the actual people who order the food. So they have knowledge about whether the food that is being served is a good one or not. Sometimes they may take the information to the chefs, sometimes they don't. This workshop is about library support for research data management. And I wish the organizers had included a librarian on this panel because we are the ones who come into day-to-day -day contact with the users of the knowledge products created within our institutions. When Professor Japon raised the question about sharing of information, um, we, I have sufficient knowledge of my experiences of how people share information within the learning environment. When Lucas raised the issue about, about uploading things to institutional repositories, the libraries have been responsible for managing institutional repositories within our institutions. When they raised the question of the costs of the materials that we buy, which are not used, I have knowledge of the pedagogical and teaching delivery processes in our universities that are my knowledge usage. And therefore, in looking at this discussion, it shouldn't only be a question of the technical dimension or the uh, uh, economic dimension, but there are serious pedagogical issues that we must confront within our institutions. As librarians, we also face challenges, but we have sufficient understanding of the issues that have been discussed here, and we are committed to ensuring that we work together with the stakeholders, and therefore we should be at the forefront of it and not at the back. I have been part of a system working elsewhere with research data management, and I think some of the issues that have been raised here, if the librarians are brought on board right from the beginning, issues about data literacy, information, and all the other things that ensure that knowledge is properly used and not accumulated will be cured. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good points made. Thank you. My name is Dr. Joshua Do from uh, Unimark. My interest is in the research fund. Um, how, it's a simple question, how sure are we that access to that fund will be easy, convenient, so that it doesn't end up like the GET funds, the uh, Cocoa Board funds, which becomes extremely political. So that as an academic, you can just write a grant, and who, who, who distributes the fund? I would suggest, if there's nothing like that, that it sits with the investors, so that the investors put the proposals and things together and this base. If it's centralized like the others, um, a lot of us who are not political will be afraid to go there because it will purely be political. 
thank you. Thank you very much. This is another very interesting question. Just to give you an idea of how we managed to get this law eventually passed. You know, before I came into government in 2017, we had continuously been hearing about this, uh, is it book allowance or uh, research allowance and all of that. When eventually, we had the opportunity to try and sit down and create something. This uh, old mentality of we do research and so give us money. And, and this is even for people who are not doing any research. There are, there are lots of uh, actors within our institutions who are supposed to be doing research but actually don't. They want to be entitled to these funds no matter what. We had looked at other models where research funding is based on need, national need, right? That you issue a call for proposals based on an issue that requires urgent attention and based on that, you apply and get the funding. That's, that's, I think, the most predominant model around the world. If you go to all the nations who are spending or investing money in research and innovation, you know, the Swiss, the Koreans, the Israelis, and all of those, they allocate a very substantial part of it into the fund, but they use it to address national priorities. Not somebody sitting somewhere and saying, I'm a lecturer, so I'm entitled to a book allowance or research allowance, whether or not they do the work. And so eventually, what happened was that the Ministry of Education, perhaps because of the pressure that was coming from uh, our universities and other research institutions, their slant of it is what eventually uh, ended up in the bill, okay? The ones that we were pressing, some of it is embedded in there. But I tell you, before the funds are generated, this bill has already allocated percentages to certain individuals or institutions. That is a big issue that needs to be addressed because those funds are not supposed to be going into the pockets of people who are already paying but because they have a title of professor or whatever, then they are entitled to that money. That's not the purpose of it. And so we need to be very, very mindful of that. Now, having said that, uh, the LI, the legislative instrument that is supposed to uh, operationalize the, the fund or the, you know, the bill or the act has not been done yet. And so we all have the opportunity to participate in it and craft it in such a way that it will yield the maximum benefit. My minister always says that for politicians like him and myself, we have an expiry date. And so at the end of this year, I may not be there to help you do what you want us to do, but you are there. It's your, it's your baby. Shape it uh, in a way that will yield the maximum benefit and prevent the, the practice we have in this country where people just want money for, you know, just for the sake that they want it. You have to work, do something, produce something before you get rewarded. It's, you know, that is not the culture in this country. And so these are some of the things that, uh, my, you know, my colleague and Shigabatia was talking about. Let us change our attitudes. And if we do, I think we have the potential and the resources that will enable us to transform our nation into something that we all are going to be very proud of. You know, thank you very much. Hello, thank you very much. Um, this is David Doku, uh, University of Cape Coast, Director of Research. Let me highlight a little bit about uh, where you just ended. 
um, as a former uh, secretary of UTAC. Um, this is the issue about book and research allowance is a monster that the government, previous government have created. And now it's becoming very difficult to um, try to take those ones. But I think the way forward is to consolidate those kind of resources into the remuneration of lecturers and then we can move the process forward. I think persons like uh, Professor Japon, I remember when he did um, delivery of uh, our research award ceremony in 2018, he mentioned that strongly. And some of us do support that, but it's something the government has created and when you want to take it, people are saying that it's a compliment. It's mo now, more or less a compliment to the uh, very small uh, salary. So we need to work on that and then we can take it. I'm speaking as a former UTAC secretary, as I said, and we have, have sat in a meeting with uh, former uh, ministers of education and other stakeholders in trying to address that issue. It didn't work because that issue needs to be fixed at that level and then we can move the process forward. Having schooled elsewhere, I know that research grants are competed for and you have to write and get it. But we need to fix that thing, and then we can move the process forward. We can't take it away without fixing what you were seeking to address in the first place. Um, I want to highlight a little bit about the issue about data ownership, which Professor Japon and others have mentioned. Um, the issue is really real about um, the fact that we have so little resources, uh, so little contribution to our research and so funders have um, certain clauses and you have to make the data available. But I am thinking that would it be possible for us to begin to quantify a bit more um, of our in-kind contribution to the research partnership? It might be small in a way, but we can quantify our in-kind contribution to research and then use that to negotiate in the contract, the research contract, whether it is um, PI or, or uh, PI from um, our end or whether it's a subcontract, we can negotiate that to own part of the data, if not all the data. So we should begin to, because we have the infrastructure there, uh, we have contribution of our time and all that, we can negotiate. It's, quite small anyway, and of course, if you are coming for equity, then you must bring something substantial to the table. It might be small, but we can start from uh, that, end, and I believe that with that, we'll be able to, at least for the data, we'll be able to negotiate ownership of the data in our research contract. And the issue about National Research Fund is very, very paramount. It's very important. Uh, I think that government shouldn't be making the excuse all the time about COVID and other hardship in running away from that if we really, really want to develop. Um, because this is very important. There is COVID, but our vehicles are running. There is COVID, but life must go on. And so even if we are not doing the 1%, proposed 1%, we could do something. Yeah, uh, 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 zero point. 5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, and so on and so forth. But if there is nothing in at all, then it means that the commitment is not there. And successive uh, 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 VCG chairs and other stakeholders have argued again and again. But always when it comes to that particular uh, uh, item, then the, the issue is that there are no resources. But we have resources for other things. So if we want to take um, research seriously, we really need to look at the contribution of the government towards funding research. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anybody oh, uh, wants to address well, that? Well, I think, I think the whole issue of the, the National Research Fund, um, if you go and download the bill and you read what is in there, uh, it's, it's a step in the right direction, but as he indicated, there are a few challenges in there which would need to be addressed as we go along the line. I, I, I will say that let us all try and see how we can help to, first of all, operationalize it 
and then we can tweak it. It's maybe 70% okay, but we want 100%. We have started from zero. So let's, let's, let's get in there and try and facilitate it because personally, I, I'm not too happy with what has been captured in the law as far as the disbursement is concerned. You can, you can go online and download. There are six points or seven points. It says one, 25% of the monies uh, will be given to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I mean, how do you make this a law? Two, 25% uh, of the money uh, on research will be on information, communication, and technology. So 25% on science, technology. I don't know whether Lucas was sitting there when he slipped <laughs> this in. You know, look, I think we as uh, professionals, we also need to learn the act of facilitating how bills are done. At the very last minute, people go in there and lobby and push certain things in there. So 25% for science, technology, engineering, everything. And then another 25% for ICT. And then you go on again and says, uh, another 25% of the fund on human genome project. Not health research, human genome project. I mean, why do you have a law on research for a country and you say you want to dedicate 25% for human genome project. At the time I saw the first draft and the second draft, or the final draft, these things were not there, you know? So it was at the last minute that, as you were saying, some people engineered and put a few things in there. Then you go to 8% for something, 13% for something. I mean, research on social sciences is not even, is not even mentioned. And I, I, it's, look, you can do everything, but if you do not engage on how to work with the community to operationalize things, forget it. Research on social sciences is not even mentioned at all. So, uh, so yeah, I like to. You, 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 you can interpret the science to include social science. Uh, I would just like to add something to what Prof has just said. Uh, <laughs> the things that he read are precisely what I was referring to in terms of the disbursement. And it goes contrary to everything that you and I know about how research funds are supposed to be used. As I said before, we still have the opportunity to first operationalize it through an ally, and I want to encourage all of you to be very, very interested in this and use your uh, institutions, uh, the networks that you have to try and ensure that the ally that comes out of this uh, is used properly. The good thing is that, first, I, I talked about the work that we are doing with the Koreans. As a result of phase one that ended in 2023, this master plan is uh, one of the projects that we have agreed to do jointly with Korea in operationalizing the National Research Fund. In fact, we are going to try and model it on how Korea's NRF uh, is, being, is being run. And starting from this year, in fact, in March, which is a team from Korea is coming down for us to start looking at how we are operationalizing the projects that they have proposed. And one of them is the operationalization of the National Research Fund, uh, hopefully modeled on how Korea is using their uh, resources to promote uh, uh, science, technology, and innovation as the vehicle for national uh, development. So, so we, we, we have an opportunity. 
let's grab it and tailor this for the benefit of you and our country. You know, that's what I would like to say. But I'm sorry, I need, to, I need to correct something. I've seen another point, but another bullet which I missed. 13% for social science, and then 8% uh, for creative arts. So it's covered. I apologize. At least the social sciences are represented. Yeah, it's it's yeah, good it's, to yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I can take just a few more questions, because I'm being told that uh, we're, it's, we're soon going to have to break for the tea break. So if I could get two more questions, please. These two people here who've been waiting a while. And uh, we'll have a comment from Omo before the panel can sum up their positions. So please, right. go ahead. Thank, thank you very much for, yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Frederick uh, from SD Dombo University of Business and Integrated Development Studies in WA. So um, I think that, yes, the whole idea about National Research Fund is a brilliant idea. But you see, we need to inspire trust in the stakeholders, the beneficiaries of that. Why am I saying this? And I would like to use an example. I'm happy uh, that he's here from uh, MEDSD. So somewhere in November last year, there was a call on various themes that universities could apply for grants. So as director of research, I put together about five teams. We worked on those applications and submitted, in fact, very we, we, we really worked late into the night sometimes. We submitted these grants. There was a deadline actually in November. It passed, no information. I just looked on the portal, it says under review. But what I've gathered is that the grants have been awarded. Yes, they have been awarded and I can confirm that monies are, are being transferred to some institutions. <clears throat> We did not get any feedback whatsoever. How would I trust that if a national research fund is set up, I'll fairly access that system? So please, there is total disbelief in this whole framework. And there was a friend who actually said, look, did you go to the ministry to talk about this application? Otherwise, forget it. You are wasting your time. So please, this is something that we are certain we are saddled with, and I'm not too happy about it. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll take another question, please. <laughs> okay. Um, mine is not a question, a very short yeah. comment. Yeah. I think the debate mm -hmm. about research and how it should be funded speaks volumes about our situation as a nation. Now, if um, we have a national research agenda for science, for education, for ICT, for creative arts. We will not be having this debate. You know, the, the thing is, what has been informing government policy over time? It should be research. And therefore, what is the investment that is being made in research? When I listen to the idea of uh, Koreans coming with some money and all that, I'm asking myself, who is setting the agenda? The thing they are coming to invest in is proposed by whom? You know, we have universities. We have them in different varieties, from colleges of education to technical universities to the traditional universities. What are they for? How are they supposed to generate research? And if we give the excuse that we have $1,500 or something given to every lecturer once a year, $1,500 uh, uh, cannot do one quality research per lecturer, micro research, you know. So we need to understand that that is not an issue at all. The issue is the agenda that the state of Ghana has and how the state plans to invest in that. And then we can set a national research agenda for all sectors of the economy and then develop mm -hmm. funds to drive research in that area. It is those monies that we will say, bring a proposal that is targeted at addressing these core issues that government wants to address. And if we find it that it is relevant to the issue, it will inform policy making. We grant you 
And so that should be separate from what we do in the academic environment to generate knowledge. I'm saying this because people who bring money, the grants that we write on our own in the various universities, they are for the agenda of somebody who has money and wants to understand a certain issue. Is that in the interest of Ghana? No. It is in the interest of the funder. So Ghana must have its interest and say, how do we invest in research to address this interest? So if we don't do that, then I think these discussions will be misplaced. It will be important, but it will not help the nation. And that's how we have been operating over the years. And I think we need to change the conversation. Thank you. I think no more you had a comment. No, no I, I think, I, 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 just before you respond, I yeah. think that's a great uh, yeah. comment. Yeah. I, um, <clears throat> I also wanted to just make the point that that's precisely what we hope to achieve with these workshops, uh, a set of coordinated yeah. activities that establishes that national sort of uh, coherence around research data management. And he's right again. It is it happens at the institutional level, whether that institution is a government institution or an academic institution. My, my, I was just going to comment regarding some of the, uh, you know, the positions we have taken and the example you, you cited about you know, your funder requiring that you make your data available. So I'm sure the librarians, if not everybody else here, will be familiar with the Nelson memo, will be familiar with the, because we have other countries that fund research, fund your research, the US, saying all publicly funded research has to be open. So it means whether you're Ghanaian, Nigerian, or from or Ivorian, if the NSF or NIH funds you, from now on, you must make it open. Yeah. Same thing with the European Council. So in Europe, that is, it's all been passed by the Council of Europe. Everything they fund, has to be open. If you don't keep it, if you don't have somewhere to keep it open, like if you have your own repositories provided by Garnet, you can keep it there. But if you don't have that, you have to keep it in their repositories because they, have, they are building repositories even for your work because they have sort of seen, all right, there's going to be a need to provide the alternative if our grantees don't have uh, repositories for these data or these publications. So I want us to also bear that in mind when we're discussing this, because it's not just about the government of Ghana's funding, it's also about the funding that you already get. You will no longer have the choice to keep the data or give the data, it will be open. And if your collective knowledge is kept outside Ghana, then we know what that means in terms of uh, the, the preset, precedent set for extractive practices in Africa. But I think we have almost finished now. But I didn't want to. I, I saw two hands up. We have a young researcher from Nigeria. Can I just ask a question, then you can close, and we can go for tea. So the two questions, very quick. OK. Um, thank you so much, uh, panelists. Um, I just want to share my experience from Nigeria. <laughs> um, we are having, uh, the issue we are having is slightly different. We have a national research fund, TED fund. And then just like um, the speaker before almost said, it's all applications, grant applications are target, targeted towards um, specific areas, okay, that are Nigerian driven areas of need. But then our challenge with that one is, as part of the requirement, you must publish your findings, your the outputs of your research in a journal that is not in Nigeria, an international journal. <laughs> okay, so I just want us to be aware that when, by the time you finish this stage of we need an NRA that is um, driven by local need and everything, they are waiting for you at the other end. Okay, yeah, so that's actually the battle now. That why, will we pub why do we have to publish in an international journal outlet and killing our local journals? So that's the stage we are. So when you're de um, developing your NRF, please ensure that whatever output comes out of the um, funded research stays in Ghana and it is published in your local journals. Yeah, thank you. Um. So, so that... that more need for infrastructure. 
So uh, one, the very last comment. All right, thank you very much for the opportunity. I am Abdulbarik Alassan from UDS. Uh, I think I want to side with the first respondent when he said that the composition of the panel um, is, is not too good because when I was asked to come for this, I was just thinking about the fact that granted the challenges that we have, we still have some data. Now, how do we manage the data? From the undergraduate research to the postgraduate research, we get data. We shelve them in the various libraries and departments. How accessible is, in, is that research to even within the university community and inter-university communities? So I think that uh, maybe the focus of our discussion should not be overly exaggerated to mean that because some people are donating to us and they want ownership of the data, that is why we have this challenge. But I want to do that contradiction that even the little data that we have, how are we managing it to ensure that even within the university system and inter-university systems, we are able to properly manage that so you can access. Now, the other thing I want to state is um, the partnership with uh, the Koreans. I think there was um, collaboration we had with a uh, Nigerian company, um, Microscale. Now, what transfer of knowledge we're all doing was at a level where it was much more theoretical. We thought that they had probably advanced to a level where they could actually do the design. But when we did collaborative work, we got to notice that the research I mean, the implementation was supposed to be done by a company in India. And so as we bring in the Koreans, our focus should not necessarily be just knowledge, knowledge, impacting knowledge, but they should also deploy the infrastructure for us to be able to, beyond the designs, to be able to implement. Thank you. Yeah. So on, on that note, we will talk to the panelists, but I would like to just make a comment on that, that we did have a survey. So I don't know how many people here responded to that survey because we didn't, very, we didn't get as much responses as we thought we would get from Ghana. So in that survey, those issues are addressed. Okay. So I, I think it's time. Yeah. The mic? Yes, I'm okay with this one. I, I thought I needed to clarify the whole issue of uh, the book and research allowance and the research fund and all that. Look, as university uh, professionals, we have the mandate to do teaching, research, and service. So everybody is obliged to do research. Uh, so somebody may want to do the research on the, as my former boss would say, the acidity of the bile of the crocodile. It, it's, it's, it's relevant. It's, it's for knowledge advancement. Eh? It's for knowledge advancement. So we should not stop those ones. And that is how people grow in their fields. But when it comes to national development, we have ministries that chart an agenda. And then the question is, what new information do we need to move this country forward? I've worked in the health sector for a very long time. So the Ministry of Health has always had a health research agenda for the country. That may not include the genome project, but the ministry may be looking at how to decide, okay, in the next five years, we want to eliminate malaria. How do we do this? So the little money that we have, we want to focus on elimination of malaria. And then the ministry would bring together people from all over, including universities, to help chart that agenda. And it happens. It, I, I used to be in charge at that point in time, so that's what I'm telling you. And I know since I left, it still happens. So every five years, there is an agenda that is set. And then within that five-year agenda, you have yearly specific agenda. So when the ministry is able to mobilize some research money, they use it to do those specific ways. 
I think we as professors or academics should engage the policy making process. Many of us are not doing that enough. So our research is just limited to the acidity of the bile of the crocodile, which is important. But you should also know how to engage and help the uptake of um, vaccines. You produce the vaccines, you show that the vaccine works. How do you ensure that it is taken up? That is what the Ministry of Health is interested in. So when we are talking about funding research, it is an entire spectrum. It's an entire spectrum. Uh, when I went to Cape Coast, I ran into challenges with Utah. When I said that the book and research allowance is basically a, a salary supplement, uh, which is true, you all know it. They are waiting for it to come so that they can roof their building and things like that. Yeah, I know you disagree on paper, but, but you know you know what it is like. When, when, I, when, I, when, when I finished making that statement, some of them came and said, Prof, why did you have to say it? We all know, but why did you have to say it? So, so the, the important thing is that the National Research Fund is different from this. It's different from this. There was an attempt to take the book and research allowance and add it to it. But I know, at least for now, there is agreement that there are two different kettle of fish. So use that one to do the acidity of the bile of the crocodile. And then let's use this one to see how we will take the nation forward. So if you are an, an agricultural scientist, you must know how to engage the Ministry of Agriculture in helping to define the research agenda for the nation. And the same applies to all the sectors. As for publishing in uh, journals that are outside the country, I have so many stories that I can tell you, but we need to uh, help our journals to grow. We all need to help our journals to grow. Sometimes we ourselves don't want to publish in those journals because uh, some of them are very mediocre. Some of them are very, very mediocre. And so we need to work at improving the quality of the journals so that when you, wh why is it that when I do very good research and I think this is very important research, I want it to go into the Lancet and not the Ghana Medical Journal. There are very good reasons for that. So we need to work at improving our local journals. And uh, when you publish some there, publish some here, so that you have a mix and then you grow. Because it will get to a point when your credibility is also being assessed. Unfortunately, the way things are structured now, if you publish only in Ghana Medical Journal, only in Ghana Medical Journal, you will not get a job in the World Health Organization. I can assure you, if it is only in the Ghana Medical Journal, that is the truth. But we do not fund national research to go and publish outside. That one I totally disagree. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Giapong. I can see you're very um, passionate about this. Yes. And um, we can take that as your concluding remark uh, okay. and move on to Mr. Boachi. Uh, there have been lots of questions around the government's role, etc. What are your concluding remarks for us? Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank you for uh, the, the opportunity that you've given for us, you know, to uh, dialogue on these very important issues. I would like to uh, conclude by first commenting on the comments that my colleague, uh, the one that talked about, yeah, what, what's your name? Frederick, okay, Kim Frederick. Uh, I, I totally agree with everything that you said. Uh, and I agree with it, not just in my mind, but also on what we have put on paper and what we intend to publish, I mean to uh, implement. I mentioned the decade of innovation and how we want to use the next 10 years to accomplish in the area of developing our research and innovation ecosystem. 
uh, my colleague uh, Roland uh, Chigabatia uh, mentioned mindset change. It's part of what we want to achieve because we want every citizen of this country to be a champion of innovation. We want to target areas where we have competitive advantage and leverage on that to develop our nation and grow our economy. We want to apply science, technology, and innovation to address challenges that we have in this country, whether it is waste management, the way we treat waste, and how it affecting our environment and the lives of our people. The way we do mining, we have a lot of resources spread all over the country in terms of minerals. But because we don't have the know-how to be able to harness these resources, look at what we are doing to our environment in Galamse, the you know, pollution of our rivers and so on. These are the areas where we need to apply science, technology, and innovation to address. All of that is captured in our decade of innovation. When I mentioned the partnership with Koreans, I didn't imply that Koreans are bringing money for us to do research so that they own the intellectual property. No. In fact, I had said it before that these are the reasons why we want to change the way we do things in this country. And so when the Koreans approached us uh, with this partnership idea, it was using the concept that we had already developed and to as the basis of the partnership that we want to form. How are they going to assist us to transform that, what we have on paper into actual ideas on the ground? The projects that I mentioned uh, that we are going to do starting from this year, they are actual facilities, infrastructure, uh, partnership that we are building in this country, not in Korea. So we are doing this with the sole intention of transferring our knowledge into actual products and services that will benefit this country. The only thing that I want to disagree with you on was what you said, 1,500 for every lecturer is, you know, uh, it's not significant. In fact, when it turns out to be in the law, because that is what was the basis of the law that we just passed, book allowance and all of that, trust me, it's not going to be insignificant. Especially if they are using the money to do nothing just because they are lecturers. And I think what Professor Japon said, we have to draw a very clear distinction between lecturers and their salaries and what this natural research, uh, National Research Fund is. They are two completely different things. Let us find ways to ensure that the work that you are doing, you are compensated adequately so that you'll be motivated to do your work. But that f money should not come from the National Research Fund because the National Research Fund has a purpose. And that is the only thing that I would like to disagree with you on. Other than that, I think we are all on the same page. We want to drive our national development agenda on, uh, with science, technology, and innovation. And I'm calling on all of you. You are the ones who should put your hands on the, uh, on the ground and make it happen. We can just create the ideas by transforming the ideas into actual uh, activities on the ground. We need your dedication, your cooperation, and your support to make that happen. So I want to thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. And finally, concluding remarks uh, from Lucas. Okay, um, so mine will be very brief. I believe that um, the custodians of knowledge in the various um, uh, institutions, educational institutions, research institutions, has to be understood by all of us. And I, I, the librarians who are, I, mean, I, I believe many people here are librarians, need to be seen 
as very important in the preservation of our knowledge systems. Okay. At the moment, we cannot talk of a national repository. We do not have a national repository. If you go to the various universities, some have, others don't have. So one of the things that we've been working on, um, uh, well, getting support from Wakren and trying to collaborate with Kalik is to see how, number one, we can help those institutions that don't have national, um, don't, that don't have repositories to have their own. And then to create, to facilitate the creation of a national repository, which would then harvest from all of the repositories within the, uh, the community. So I think unless and until we understand that this is important to have and provide the needed resources, we won't move very far. As I said in the beginning, we download more than uh, we upload. And that is a reflection that we are consumers and not, um, even if we are creators, we are not making our creations available to the global community. We need to strengthen the infrastructure. We need to have policies that encourage us to be innovative, to, to create a store and disseminate. Uh, so this would be my concluding remarks. And of course, we need to change our mindset. We talk too much, we don't do much. Okay, that needs to change. It, it is a big problem in this country. And sometimes I get very frustrated because you're, you're chasing people, you show them the value. They see the value, but don't do it. You know, uh, it's difficult to understand why we do this, but it's a very, very big problem. Big, big, big problem, which we need to try and work on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Madam Moderator, can, can I have 30 seconds, please? Sorry? <laughs> can I have 30 seconds, please? I'm, I'm uh, you. What our friend from UDS said and what Lucas just said has just triggered something. Uh, the relevance of the repositories that he's talking about. And uh, one problem that we are having a lot more these days is the whole issue of plagiarism by our students. Uh, somebody takes thesis from KNUST, he just removes the cover and put their name on it and present it at the University of Ghana. If they were all in these repositories and they could be scanned, it would make assessment much, much easier. So we should have a lot more investment in this field so that we can also improve our library and, uh, and our, our university environment, especially the issue of plagiarism. Thank you. Thank Madam you moderator, much. can I have my 30 seconds? <laughs> <laughs> Following on what uh, Professor Jampong said and uh, Lucas, I think it's important to stress that point you just made. Because I see universities investing in plagiarism tools. So you are putting money into Turnitin, now, Turnitin will scan other people's data to give you that originality score. If you don't have your own local repositories that it can scan, then this issue that Professor Japong and Lucas has raised um, is not resolved. So you're basically paying money, but you're not solving the problem. So please. All right, so that probably is the final word. And can everyone please join me in congratulating the panelists for such a very energetic <laughs> conversation. I think we are now breaking for tea, so where exactly is that? Okay, so thank you, Dr. Abbott. I think I'll take over from here. So we have two exit points, this one and then that one. But a tea table is to my left. Okay, but before we do that, we want to take a group photo. Um, the panelists will take a group photo first with the organizers of the event, and then we all take a group photo. Then we proceed to the tea table. So please cooperate with us. So the, the panel team will take a group photo first. Photographer.
Then can we have the team from Roo Forum? Just a quick one. The team from Roo Forum. Roo Forum. If you are here uh, on the invitation of Roo Forum, can we have you quick, please? Quick. Please join the, 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 the team here, the panel team here. Roo Forum. Roo Forum. Then we'll have the group photo now. Please, can we all come up? Let us know. Please, are you ready? Please hold, please hold. Ready? Thank you very much. So please, you can proceed through this exit door or here for the. So it's for tomorrow, tomorrow. Yes. So please, you can either have your tea break outside or you can bring it inside here. You can have it outside. We have tables and chairs there, or you can bring it inside here.
when you proceed Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, we're about to start the second uh, session before the lunch break. And um, this will be the presentation of some survey results that we have done uh, here in Ghana. 
We have surveyed a number of librarians, research administrators, and researchers slash academics within uh, several Ghanaian institutions, uh, universities mainly, and um, we now have the results of the, that survey to present back to you. So we asked them a number of questions about research ethics and research data management governance within their institutions and what they knew about these, these practices and policies and um, gathered information about that, analyzed it, and um, we're about to present to you what we found from those presentations. All right, so I'm Dr. Pamela Abbott, and I'm from the University of Sheffield, the information school there, and I've been working as a senior research lead with LibSense for the last seven years. With me today is Dr. Fatima abdul Dayan, and I'll let her briefly introduce herself. Okay, thank you, Pam. Hello, everyone. My name is Fatima Jibril abdul Dayan. I'm a lecturer at the Department of Library and Information Science, Federal University of Technology, MENA, Nigeria. I'm also the chairperson of the Nigerian Library Association in Niger State, um, and a postdoc researcher with LipSense, and I've been working with Dr. Pam, you know, with, in them um, compiling and analyzing the survey, which we're going to share the results with you shortly. Thank you. You might ask why is a Nigerian involved with this? It's because we ran the very same workshop and the very same survey among several Nigerian universities. We've just come from Nigeria where we presented that information there. So this is the Ghanaian part of the data gathering. Okay, so can we have the first slide? I will let uh, Fatima begin. All right, okay, so, um, the aim and objective of this research is one to assess the current state of research data management practices and governance in Ghanaian institutions with specific focus on the roles of libraries and research administration units, right? So the survey is basically targeted at librarians, those are identified as research administrators, um, researchers, lecturers in academic institutions in Ghana. And then we hope to identify gaps in awareness, skills and competencies are related to RDM, as well as the development and implementation of research data management and research ethics policies and guidelines that are existing in our institutions, either at institutional level, national or even international level. And then the research seeks to provide recommendations for national collaboration and capacity building initiatives to improve RDM policies and practices ultimately aiming to enhance the effective management, preservation, and sharing of research data to support scientific progress and innovation in Ghana. Like Dr. Pam said, we're already doing that in Nigeria, and then we had a very um, fruitful discussions, and um, we are hoping that at the end of our intervention, we'll be able to have, we must have been able to have achieved these objectives that are listed here. Thank you. Um, next slide. All right, we have uh, the population for this research work, like I said earlier, it's comprised of librarians, research administrators, and researchers from 47 institutions in Ghana. Um, the, we ran the survey, the survey for um, about six months or less last year, and then of about um, over 100 institutions, you know, that were invited. We only got responses for 47 institutions in Ghana. Okay, and then we had a, a total of 99 responses, out of which 47 were complete and found usable for analysis. So we have a response rate of 47.47 percent. Yeah. So for the functional units represented, um, we have the highest percentage coming from um, the library, that's the librarian, and then followed by academic or research staff from the 47 institutions, and then we have the least um, responses from research administrators. Those are identified as being um, in the research administration. Then, um, the majority of the respondents were librarians, obviously, but then it's slightly different from what we had in Nigeria. In Nigeria, we had more of academic um, 
research staff, that's lecturers, researchers, at about 77% um, in Nigeria, then followed by librarians, 41%. So it's different in Ghana. We have more responses from librarians than academic and research staff. Next slide. So these are the top four institutions with the highest response rates. Uh, we had the highest response rate from the Kumasi Technical University, that's about 13%, um, followed by the University of Health and Allied Sciences, and then Asheshi University and the National Film and Television Institute. Do we have anyone from any of the four listed um, institutions? Okay, okay, all right. Next slide, please. So the survey may find main findings. Dr. Pam will lead on that, yeah. Thank you, Fatima. So to begin with, we wanted to draw your attention to the responses we received about research ethics and uh, policies and guidelines, both what the current status was uh, as reported by our respondents and their awareness, basically how did they get to hear about these research ethics policies and guidelines. So it appears as though the situation in Ghana is not too bad, so it's a high level of policy development and implementation that we're seeing. Uh, for example, uh, it has been reported that about 42.55% of these policies and guidelines have been fully implemented in those institutions that we surveyed. And it's also reported that about 61.70% have been developed. So that's quite a high level of um, development and implementation. Uh, in addition to that, we have on the other side, basically we ask them, how do you hear about these policies? How do you know they exist and where, where to access them? And we had these responses that basically the library at 42.55%, that was seen to be the, one of the key areas where you would get information about these policies. 63.83% uh, from the research administration function, so overwhelmingly most people answered that option, and also the researcher's department. So in some way it is kind of shared between those three units within the university at those different levels. Next slide, please. So this tells us a bit more of the story of um, who so we're talking about governance, so who is responsible for developing research ethics policies and guidelines and who is responsible for implementing them? Again, overwhelmingly, the research administration function was seen to be the key um, unit at 70.21% for developing the policies and implementing at 68.09%. And you can, again, compare that to the research ethics and policies awareness, the how do they get to know about them, and you can see that this matches very well with um, the, um, in the claim that they get to know about these policies mostly from the research administration function. Next slide, please. Okay. So we're moving on a bit more now to the uh, research data management policies and guidelines. And here we can see that um, the situation here is slightly different to that of research ethics. So we have got um, about 13% uptake in the implementation that's been reported to us of research data management policies and guidelines. So where it's been fully implemented, it's only at about 13%. However, there's obvious activity around them being developed and them being partially implemented. And plus a plan to develop. So it's not a terrible situation, it's just that the uptake right now is not that high. I think we move from the slide that I was presenting. Could we go back, please? Yep, that's where I was. Okay, so um, in terms of 
looking at the comparison with where we are with research ethics policies and guidelines, development and implementation, you will see that that is in a much more healthy state. So if you compare the two, you would see that the RDM policy and guidelines, um, sort of uh, the establishment of those is lagging a bit behind, but that's expected because it is quite a new area. Next slide, please. So now, um, awareness, when we compare the sources of awareness, where do they find out about research ethics policies and guidelines, and where do they find out about RDM policies and guidelines? Again, we see this theme emerging that uh, research administration is expected to be the point, the main source for this information. However, there's also expected to be a part played by the library function and the researcher's department. Those percentages are also quite high. Uh, what is not really clear at the moment is what, in what ways should this uh, awareness happen? Who's responsible? Again, it goes back to governance. Who's responsible for what parts? What parts are they playing in ensuring that there is awareness of the policies and guidelines? Um, another key point to, to, to draw your attention to is that there were quite a number of uh, respondents reporting that they relied on word of mouth to find out about these policies. So around 17% for research ethics and around 19% of the respondents for uh, research data management. The issue with that is that word of mouth can lead to incorrect uh, to rumor and incorrect uh, information, and therefore the implementation of the policies would actually suffer uh, as a result of that. So that's quite a high percentage, really, of people relying on word of mouth type uh, information about these policies. Next slide, please. Uh, now again, to responsibilities for developing RDM policies and uh, implementing them, where do they lie? Uh, again, research administration function is seen as the main place where this responsibility lies, with also quite a high uh, expectation around the library function as well for developing and implementing policies. So um, from this, we have, uh, again, when we compare this back to the research ethics policies and guidelines, we see a very similar kind of um, sort of trend there as well. Um, it's just slightly more, uh, the, the proportion is slightly more in favor of library function for RDM. So it's not clear to what extent the library or the um, home department need to play, what is their role that they need to play with this uh, res developing and implementing, and that's the sort of thing that we can talk about a bit later uh, today. Now I'll hand you back over to Fatima, who's going to do the remainder of these uh, findings. Okay, thank you, Pam. Next slide. <clears throat> now, responsibility for managing research data. Research data management, um, there, there are stakeholders around research data management, and it um, involves um, a collaboration between the library, the research and administration units, okay, the researcher themselves and their department, and then the university management. But from the findings so far, in terms of policy implementation, development and implementation, it seems um, from our report that it's more of research administration and the librarian's voice are not um, clearly heard, as in how they actually contribute to research data management. Now, there are different research data management activities which we try to highlight on this slide data management plan at the start of a research project, organizing your data, how you store, secure data during the research project from the beginning to the end, 
And then issues around preservation, security, sharing, and reuse at the end of the project. These are RDM activities, and each of these stakeholders have their role to play at each level. But then from this report, we could see that um, responsibility for managing reset data, yeah, people are seeing responses, shows that they see it as a library function and research administration function. And then um, unknown, that's for those that it's not really clear to them whether it should be something that librarians should champion or it should be um, a research administration function. Next slide. All right, so current status of institutional policy and guidelines around data protection. Um, we asked questions around um, institutional data protection policies or guidelines, whether they've been fully implemented, if they have been developed, partially implemented or fully implemented. And then we have just them um, 19.1. 0.15% saying that in their institution, um, data protection policies and guidelines have been fully implemented. So there seemed in general to be very little uptake of data protection policy and guidelines at the institutional level. Next slide. All right, we asked question whether your institutions currently offer training in research data management. Okay, and this speaks to the need for capacity building, you know, around um, what should be done in offering research data services at institutional level. And then the overwhelming response is a no, that there's no institutional um, training around research data management. Then we went further to ask um, the areas that um, respondent would like to be trained on as it regards to say data management and we broke it down into three rdm principles and practices training others in rdm and digital resources for implementing rdm and then you can see from the responses that the first three are areas of capacity building for librarians research administrators or even lecturers at department level they need training around the rdm pr principles and practices training others you know in research data management that part is actually important for us librarians because we need to offer that services so we need to know what to do when it comes to offering research data services so that we can as well um, train our users in the library the digital resources for implementing research data management is also very high there's a high need for that next slide all right we also asked question about training around research ethics um, and then the response is yes and no. See, it's not uh, clearly, um, it's not too separate, but then we still have an overwhelming um, response saying yes, there are um, trainings around research ethics. At least it's higher, around 47%, and it also aligns well with the rate of implementation of research ethic policy. Yeah, so we further um, asked about the levels of development and implementation of research ethics. And then we had uh, the highest responses coming from um, say, agreeing that research ethics policy and guidelines have been developed in their institution. And I think from the panelists that we had earlier, there are so many um, conversations around the um, existing research policies in Ghana. The situation is different for us in Nigeria at institutional level. It's completely um, a different story. Pam will actually show the differences in responses around these areas, comparing what we got from Nigeria and then the situation here in Ghana. Next slide. Okay, so this is the, um, the last finding um, where we asked the respondents if they could see benefit of instituting research communities at university level for effective knowledge sharing about the principles of open science, research data management, and research ethics. Research data management and research ethics are actually core components of open science, right? Because it's only when your data is properly managed that you, you will be able to contribute meaningfully to the open science um, ecosystem. And then you have to, you must have been conducting your research ethically, you know, for you to be willing to share. So all these these two components of RDM and research ethics are very important um, to the open science. So we asked um, respondents uh, if they could see the benefits of having research research communities, okay, like a group of um, researchers doing something around RDM and research ethics on our institutions. 
and then we had this um, responses, qualitative analysis. Um, for creating research communities, they agreed that yes, having that on universities would help to enhance um, development of the institution and also improve discussion around research ethical issues. Remember, we had more of people saying they get information about ethics and RDM through word of mouth. Yeah, so I guess that's what is playing out here, that it will help to improve discussion around research ethical issues and then ability to leverage existing research groups for education and information and to also improve human capital, technological progress and development on campus and then we asked about their perception on sharing open practices and value and they agreed that yeah it could help promote awareness capacity building and research production and monitoring of research processes and also minimize um, loss of data um, and when asked about uh, collaboration for the co-creation of RDM strategies and uh, we got responses around the need for interdepartmental workshops and conferences interinstitutional research collaboration you know someone in the university of ghana should be able to um, collaborate with a researcher from another university in ghana and even outside ghana but then we need a uniform kind of framework that everybody could collaborate easily um, then we have leveraging existing research groups and unit and the last thing is sustaining all these strategies that are listed are very important to supporting the open science infrastructure next slide okay so Pam will take the comparison between the Nigerian responses and that of Ghana thank you thank you Fatima so uh, moving on uh, I've got here a comparison <laughs> of some of the data that we gathered from Nigeria compared with the data gathered from Ghana. So what needs to be remembered here is that um, the researcher slash academics side, there were a greater proportion of those sorts of uh, people responding as opposed to librarians. And the opposite is true here with the Ghana sample that there's a greater proportion of those identifying as librarians as opposed to those identifying as researchers. So just uh, doing a rough sort of comparison, no sort of statistical comparison here, just a rough look at what the percentages work out to be. It seems that in terms of awareness, one of the things we were asking about, how do they find out about the policies, etc. There certainly seems to be uh, around the research ethics responses from Ghana, seems to be more uh, of a sense that they felt this should really be coming from research administration. So it's just a slight difference, but just a higher percentage appear to feel that way. And similarly around RDM. So in both cases, we got this higher percentage of those responding, saying, well, it should be with research administration. And then again, in terms of the, the policy development, a uh, higher percentage from the Ghanaian respondents saying, well, we think that the library should be involved in policy development. And this bears true with the discussions we had in Nigeria as well, because there was a sense there amongst the librarians that were present that it's not their business. <laughs> so um, it, we got a different response here in, in Ghana. And just, again, slightly different in terms of RDM, uh, a slight percentage um, uh, difference. Um, and then around policy implementation, uh, researchers' home department, there seemed to be, uh, in, amongst the Nigerian sample, uh, a sense that they thought the researchers' department should be more involved in uh, implementing the policy. Uh, research ethics policy and RDM policies. So um, just a slide, just bringing that to your attention. Of course, you have to remember the samples are not, you know, there's, the Ghana one was much smaller than the Nigerian one and they were skewed, each of them in different directions. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Next slide. Moving on, we just come on to the last part of our presentation where we have some recommendations. Um, so the very same recommendations were also uh, given at the last workshop. Um, based on the data and the sorts of um, responses we were getting, so recommendation one, I'm going to stand on this side so I can read it better. So recommendation one, 
um, that uh, governance of research ethics and RDM policy development, its implementation and its communication, making people aware, uh, needs to be a shared responsibility between the library, research administration, the researcher's home department. So that's coming out clearly from the data. Uh, the responsibility for research ethics and RDM training needs also needs to be devolved between the library, research administration, and the researcher's home department. Uh, number three, a clear distinction needs to be made between the institutional functions responsible for developing the broad frameworks of how RDM and research ethics policies and guidelines uh, and the mechanisms that should be in place uh, should be instantiated. So there needs to be a distinction made between the people developing those frameworks of how things should run within these institutions and the functions that are actually responsible for implementing those frameworks. So somebody's got to be responsible for the overall frameworks, somebody else responsible for the implementation. And that somebody, the distinguishing between who these somebodies are is, is um, a, the job of strategy, the job of de defining what these governance structures should look like. Uh, number four, a clear distinction also needs to be made as to which functions will manage the infrastructure um, intended to support these frameworks once they are implemented and which functions will develop and maintain them. So again, somebody has got to do to create or establish the research infrastructures that are going to support these policies and somebody else has to develop these and maintain them. Who are these people? What are their roles within the organization? How can you identify them? So those are governance issues around recommendation four. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Not yet. We're not ready to thank anyone yet. Back, back one, please. Yeah, thank you. So number five, uh, research ethics and RDM policies at the institutional level should align with national policies around the protection of data and privacy if they exist. We were lucky enough in Nigeria to have the national, what is it called? The National Data Protection Agency present in the panel who explained that they had just initiated a policy around that in Nigeria. So similarly here, if such policies exist at the national level, whatever is produced around RDM and research ethics policies at the institutional level needs to align with that. And that's the responsibility of those functions within the institutions who are developing those policies. Uh, number six, institutional and national level policies around research ethics and RDM, if they exist, should also, institutional and national, yeah, should also be aligned, right? So um, more or less the same uh, uh, concept as the one before, except that we're just talking, in the first one we talk about protection, uh, the protection policies, in the second one we're just talking about general policies. Number seven, policy development in research ethics and RDM should be aligned with a systematic training and upskilling plan to inform, communicate, and make those policies visible and actionable. So again, from the Nigeria workshop, we had uh, instances of people saying, oh, I don't know if the policy exists. There were quite a lot of I don't knows in the responses there. Uh, so this needs to be kind of action to make sure once those policies are in place, people know where to find them, know what they mean, get regular training around them, etc. Number eight, consideration should be given to developing collaborative research ethics and RDM policies. For example, those that would help shape, shape data sharing guidelines between collaborating researchers 
and should be available at the national and institutional levels. So what this is about is if you're collaborating with partners who are outside of your institution, they may be outside of your institution and in Ghana, or they might be outside of your institution and abroad, there need to be ways of developing collaborative agreements so that the ethics and the RDM policies are appropriately managed. So we heard this morning on the panel of situations where the funder who is funding a collaborative project has certain RDM policies and um, the sort of collaborating partner here in Ghana is obliged to follow them. However, what we're suggesting is that collaborative agreements need to be put into place to manage those things so that both sides get what they want within their own national guidelines. Next slide, please. All right, so after lunch, this will be the activity that we're going to do. We'll have some breakout groups. And in the breakout groups, we hope for you to address three sets of questions. Uh, the first one is about how institutional governance structures uh, can work to improve policy direction and research ethics and research data management. The second, about how to align inter-institutional and international collaborations with these institutional and national policies on both of these, again, research ethics and RDM. And the third one, to discuss strategies for capacity building and infrastructure provision around the governance of these two areas. And tomorrow, so today we start working on these discussion topics. We're going to use a template to do that, which is going to have a work plan as part of it. And tomorrow we continue doing the same work and con complete those work plans in the morning session uh, that has been scheduled for tomorrow morning. Um, if the person at the back could click on the link, I hope it works, the work plan template link, so we can see what that looks like. If you can click on that link, please. Uh, clicking on the work plan template link, We'll just see if we can get that uh, particular link um, loaded. Just give us a few minutes, we'll get that template up on the screen. So um, we promise you that that will be up on the screen at some point in time, but we are more or less at the end of our presentation of this uh, survey. So we can now take some questions while the work plan is loaded onto the screen. And once that's on the screen, we can explain it a bit better. So if we could take some questions, please, about this uh, presentation. Yes, please. Can we get the microphone, please?
Uh, hello, thank you. Mine is not so much a question, Pamela, uh, as much as um, a, com a comment. Um, I find that in my institution in KNUST, one of the key things that informs whatever we do is the university strategic plan. The KNUST university strategic plan that envisions where the university wants to be five years from now, ten years from now. And in that st strategic plan, you would find sub-teams and sub-goals. Uh, in there is something on research. But I doubt if I have seen anything specifically on research data management. So we have a backward looking and a forward looking issue here. That at the time when the strategic plan was being crafted, maybe questions about research data management was not seen as prominent. And now we find ourselves in a situation where this has become prominent. So the question is how you go back and interrogate those strategic plans. Um, there may be elements in the strategic plans and key strategic objectives that kind of capture and reflect elements of research data management without stating it explicitly. Hmm. And you find that each of the colleges and the departments develop sub-strategic plans referencing the institutional strategic plan down to the library. Hmm. So my point here is, if we are going to look forward to addressing issues around research data management, we have to perhaps go uh, back, because if institutions are going to commit to it and commit money to it and look forward in terms of the budgetary process, all these things are key. Uh, so it's just a comment rather than on the presentation of the data. Uh, thank you, Sam, for raising that question. Um, one counter comment that I'll make, which I think you'll find um, complicates things, is that we are in this environment now where technology is just forcing a lot of changes on us very quickly. And of course, what we're talking about here, ultimately, it's about open science, it's about sharing data openly, it's about all these open platforms, and um, uh, research data management has come to the fore because of this. Uh, so it is difficult when you have done a five-year plan and within those five years, massive changes take place. For example, within the last five years, we had the pandemic, which then forced a lot of digitalization on university processes. And so all of a sudden, whatever strategies you had in place before then would become defunct. So it is a, a really good question that you're raising and no easy answers to it. Strategies are just going to have to change because the environment is so turbulent. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. That was a good presentation. But I just want to find out, did you try to find out whether the institutions offer any RDM service or the libraries that you surveyed offer any RDM service? Because on this premise that we can you know, develop our policies and other advocacies. So I just want to find out. Thank you. Uh, good question again. So the, the survey concentrated on governance issues mainly. So it asked about the policies and I suppose obliquely about services because when we ask them about implementation, it would be assumed that if these are implemented, potentially services exist. But that particular explicit question wasn't in there. It was more about the governance of these policies. Yeah. Okay, let, let me just <laughs> add on to what I said. Because I've done a survey that uh, the findings suggest that most academic institutions in Ghana do not have RDM service. What they have is just semblance of RDM service using the institution repository. And so I think it would have been better if you had put in the RDM service to find out whether they offer those services. I think that's, that's great. It would be great if you could share your results with us. We'd love to read about that, myself and my colleague um, who's doing similar research in Nigeria. It would be great to see those responses. But I think you probably found that there's very little uptake in your research, which is, it's understandable. This is a new area. Okay, thank you. 
I also like to find out if um, there was a target on the category, I mean the staffing levels who were answering the questions. Because I've had a situation where somebody in charge of collecting postgraduate theses was not aware that the institution was subscribing to a tenetine, you know, software. And so when somebody comes and says this was not done, then the person is confused. So when these questions are asked, who is actually responding? Is the person aware that the questions you are asking are there or not? So for instance, if these are librarians, I'm talking of the institutional librarian, the head librarian responding, they would most likely know than when you know, some other assistant or junior librarian is, is doing so. Thank you. Uh, good question. Um, so I think I'll turn over to Omofo to answer that question. So in terms of the distribution of the survey, I think we asked certain uh, groups to distribute the survey. So yes. the answer could lie there, yeah. So uh, for those that respond, can I, just with a show of hands, can I get a sense of how many people in the room responded to the survey? Show of hands. So you see what I mean? So um, not very represented. Uh, because the survey is probably expired. This survey started in Ghana in October. We're working with, we thought we would leverage the power of networks and work with colleague, which we thought would get the message to the librarian network and Vice Chancellors Ghana uh, for research administration and research. As you can understand, it's an online survey. It's, we are limited to the mechanisms that are available. We thought that was a master stroke. That if we had colleague and we had VCG, we would reach as many people as possible. Um, we're glad that we're taking all your names now, so we now know you individually, and then we won't have this we don't know how we had link it. We will send to you directly next time, but we had a challenge uh, getting feedback from Ghana. I think I noticed that the survey is still open when I looked at it on Saturday. And I, I think I saw uh, an end date of 31st of January. I, I think, think we so, changed yeah. that date because we're getting desperate. It should have stopped in December, but we found out after like two months we had only had 15 responses from Ghana, and two months and about 10 reminders. So uh, clap for yourselves. <laughs> I think um, some data is better than no data, though. And I suppose that's the premise we have to use, that we need to raise awareness. So having something to talk about is better than not having anything to speak about. OK, so um, the work plan template is now here. And I can present this to you. So this is available in a Google Doc format, I promise. And we even have a bit.ly um, QR code for it, which you will get uh, later. Now, um, this is the work plan, plan template. In the first part of the work plan template, we tell you what are the different parts of the document that need to be filled in. So these are just explanatory notes right at the top saying what the priority area means, what the ex explanatory notes about that priority area, questions, objectives, strategies, responsibility, and timeframes. Everything is explained there. You'll be using this this afternoon to start doing the breakout group work. We will come around to each of the tables and we will explain again using this work template format. A little bit further down, you can actually see the, um, the actual tables, the, 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 the parts that need to be filled in. So if we could just see one of them, right, here we are. So <clears throat> going back up a bit, just to the first priority area. So we have six priority areas. They're all around governance, about policies at the institutional and national levels. All of that is there. Um, and of course, we are talking about research ethics and RDM in each case. 
So we have some notes saying what these, uh, what we mean by some of the wording that we're using to describe the priority area. For example, priority area 1B is about governance structures for research ethics in RDM at the national level. We explain what we mean by governance structures, what do we mean by national, and then we have some prompting questions where we get you to think in your groups about the answers to these questions, which kind of will help you to tease out the other parts of the template that we're looking for which are objectives, strategies, responsibility and timeframes. So objectives would be what can you do uh, that's feasible and actionable uh, in order to address research ethics and, research and RDM governance issues. And what strategies would you put into place? What sort of actions would you put into place to uh, get those objectives done? Whose responsibility would it be? And in what time frame can it be done? So once you've done that for your different objectives, you'll have something that begins to look like a work plan. That's the idea. And it will be things that people can do because we all know that um, institutions have hierarchies and structures that are already in place that can impede uh, getting progress. Um, so these are really actions that you think you might be able to actually influence in your own roles. So that's what we'll be looking at this afternoon. Uh, other questions, please? All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Safo. Uh, thinking about the protection of the research data, and I heard I mean, Fatima mention about Nigerian passing this data protection law. And I want us to be mindful of this data protection law. Data protection law, I have done a survey over the world, and it only focuses on personal data. So if your research is not about personal data, it might not be enough to protect it at the national level. So we need to be mindful when we are developing our own policies, we need to get other policies as well. Thank Good you. point. Did you want to speak to us, Fatima? Fatima is that you? a bit shy. Could you tell us a bit more about the policy in Nigeria? That would be a good, yeah. Yes. Okay, yes. So he's right. The policy, it's a, it's a concept. In, you know, as far as ethics is concerned, and research data management will be the primary area that does, that will be the intersection with the data protection regulations in any country and the research data management principle. But there's also, in some cases, uh, depending on the uh, ethical protocols that cover your data, it might also be because of where it is connected or what the regulations say about that particular kind of data. Think indigenous data, for instance, or some other kind of data that the country might seek to protect. So they might give you, there might be guidelines that you need to be aware. So we did, in Nigeria, we had um, somebody from the, they have passed a new data protection act, it was the act, some act that created something in law that the universities were not even aware of in the main. So it was a good opportunity to discuss that. And I think you're right. We need to also include them as, they, as we move on um, in all of this. I'd hope that GTEC would have honor our invitation uh, and come. So we thought some of these would have been resolved by the presence of AAU and GTEC, but unfortunately um, they had, um, in the case of GTEC, they did not re respond to several reminders, but the AAU representative had to be somewhere else. So, but yes, in the, in the work plans and the breakout sessions, please include all of that. So, one other thing about this lack of awareness. Can I assume that if you've registered for this workshop, you are willing for us to add you to our community?
Yes, so we're just going to talk about the breakout sessions this afternoon. I'll pass you over to Fatima to see how we're trying to arrange them. Okay, um, we, from the list that I passed around earlier, we have about 28 um, people that identify as researchers or lecturers, and then five research administrators, and then 14 librarians, okay? So what we want is a table of seven. I think EFA will help with that. Um, and then we need you to break out into sessions, but we don't want two people from the same institution on the same table. And then we don't want uh, lecturers and researchers to be together. So we want it to be like ratio two to one, a mix of researchers, administrator and librarians. Yeah, so that's what we want right now for the breakout session. So this will happen after lunch, but we're letting you know in advance that this is what we're looking for. Mixed tables where you've got different people from different institutions, different roles. So we have to have a system. What if you have only 28? You mean they're only like about yeah, two to one, two to one, except um, oh, my name. Okay, okay. So I, I'll just pass it around again. I think we'll have. All right. Okay. Okay. people in the group, right? So yes, we we'll just say exactly. group. So we want to do this in the most efficient way, um, which is not something I'm very good at. But um, so we would, we need, let's get the ratios again. How many librarians do we have to research administrators? We have one research administrator on each table. There are only five of them, so that makes it. So we don't have to worry about research administrators. They, have, they can only be on five group, in five groups as it is, because there are only five of them. Um, we've got how many librarians? Is it two to one? No, 24. 24 librarians and uh, 48 le lecturers? So they're going to put the tables together. I think what we should do is, is just move the chairs in, be in between, push the tables and put the other chairs on the other side. If you do that with each set of tables, then we can do that very quickly. So look at what I mean, since you know, we knock people are better at this. And then people, we just put this on top. Take this one, all right? Push the tables together. No, no, you take the tables, the chairs out. And, every, and if you can help do that too, on your rows. Okay. All right. All right. So on each on each table, we need two researchers from two different institutions. No, four four researchers from four different institutions. Two librarians from two different institutions. You're a librarian? You're fine? You're... Yes. We have an extra administration. So, uh, so the six, okay? Yes, six. No, we don't want any incestuous connection. So find some other table. Um, so please... So, so close, yeah. You know yourselves, two librarians, four lecturers, one research administrator. Then you need to just pull this around, close that. Then I can email that. 
Need to edit it. Just send the link. Yes, yeah, you can read it. it. You can read it. It's read only now. It's not. A... Oh, I see. They can create a copy. Oh, sorry. We, we just give them instructions. He doesn't need to create a copy. They need to create a copy on their side. Okay, 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 okay. okay. Let's 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 change it then. But they're all going to write into the same document. I know where it is. Just a minute. Can I just unplug this? No, just take from no, 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 take from here. Thank you. I made it read. It's, it's in the F F Studio Ghana folder. So this is it, isn't it? This one. So I just I didn't give them. Okay, I'll just give them. Um, yeah, they could have just made a copy and just and just did their own. But yes, let's make it simpler, like you said. And the internet access is not exactly that fast. Well, 
Okay. You should have edit access now. So we have, see, very good. It's a very good sign. So we've got everybody. One, two, three, four, five. Seems like more than seven. <laughs> okay. So um, does everybody have a research administrator on their table? How many tables don't have administrators? There's no administrator here. Is there an administrator on this table? Oh, yes, one. What about that table? Research administrators. This table, one. That table, one administrator. So, okay, let's use the opportunity to first of all get, I mean, to know yourself.